Hello and welcome to Cardiac Imaging Agora. In this session, we will discuss when and how to perform cardiac PET to detect myocardial hibernation. So I start with this quote and I just, uh, you know, modify it a bit. This is from uh, Tolstoy's Anna Karenina. And what it starts is all normal hearts are normal in the same way and all abnormal hearts or myocardium are abnormal in different ways. And we'll go over these, this quote and the explanation for it in the next uh, few slides. The first thing is I used to, when I was a fellow, to believe in this dictum that if you do a perfusion imaging and you find less than 50% uptake of tracer, that indicates usually a, an infarct. Over the years and with maturity and uh, uh, age, I figured out that this dictum probably is not applicable in all cases. These are examples here. On the left upper hand side, you can see a fixed defect from rest to stress. And we presume that this area here in the LAD territory in the apex, apical anterior wall is all infarcted and because there is no change from rest to stress and there is no evidence of ischemia. Similarly, on the right hand side here, we see a large inferolateral defect, sorry, a lateral defect involving the lateral wall and the rest and stress images. And again, this could represent scar too. However, if you go down to the bottom images here, you can see there's this very mild reversible, reversibility in the defect in the apex of the left ventricle and the LAD territory is actually a reflection of marked evidence of hibernation, as you can see it in the bottom screen on the FTG images. So despite the fact that you have oh, probably less than 50% FTG uptake, or sorry, perfusion here, in the uh, apex, you're ending up with a uh, significant amount of hibernation as uh, depicted on the FTG images. So we'll start with this very simple uh, uh, explanation. So that this functional myocardium, if it's not dead, has the potential to improve with revascularization. And if you improve the myocardium, hopefully you'll improve the ejection fraction. So we used to do that with dobutamine echo. We use some, we use some dobutamine to detect inotropic support and inotropic response. And we can see if we can improve the contractility of the left ventricle or the segments. With PET, we're looking, with probably with thallium, we're looking for cell uh, membrane integrity with thallium. And with FTG, we go down here to detect a switch from fatty metabolism to glucose uh, to support the myocardium. And this all will probably, in a way, we're looking at characteristics by non-invasive imaging that correlate with living cell histology. First, before we decide to do myocardial hibernation, let's discuss when not to do myocardial uh, viability assessment. Patients with normal EF, left ventricular ejection fraction, should not have assessment for viability. They could have assessment for ischemia, but not viability, because by definition of the ejection fraction is normal, the amount of myocardium at risk or hibernating myocardium is going to be extremely small or non-existent. Patients with CAD and no targets for revascularization should not be assessed for uh, hibernating myocardium because in any case, you're going to treat them medically since revascularization is not possible and therefore you're not going to expect improvement in ejection fraction or uh, mortality with revascularization. It's going to be all driven by medical therapy. Patients with normal coronary arteries and normal or abnormal LVEF should not be assessed for myocardial hibernation unless you're looking for uh, you know, inflammation on other things, and that we will talk about in a separate talk when we talk about sarcoid. In patients with prior PET FTG scans showing no viability in a certain territory, let's say in the LAD territory as I showed you before, these patients should not be assessed for viability in the LAD territory because we don't expect dead cells to recover and become alive. Simple concepts sometimes overlooked in clinical practice. Now, if we go for, uh, again, some other instances where you should not use FTG for assessment of uh, viability, if you have normal perfusion at rest, if all the segments are perfused at rest, that's by definition a viable myocardium. Now you can assess that for ischemia, but not for FTG uptake or viability. Also, if you have ischemia, 
a segment that's proven to be ischemic, that's by definition viable and should not be assessed with FDG unless you're looking for ischemic memory, which theoretically and academically important, but probably from a practical standpoint is not. This is a, a schema or a diagram that I use very often in my practice. It's never been tested clinically in a clinical trial, but at least it makes sense. We have ischemic myocardium is suspected. I usually send the patients for cardiac cath or these days probably CTA uh, if suitable. If they're not suitable for revascularization after the cath because of, or the CTA because the coronaries are normal, or because you have severe diffuse disease that's not suitable for revascularization, we treat these patients medically or we send them for transplant. If they're suitable for revascularization, then we start assessing them uh, for viability. If they're non-viable, we treat medically. If the myocardium is viable and suitable for revascularization, we send them for bypass surgery or for uh, intervention, percutaneous intervention, of course, in addition to medical therapy. Again, this, this schema, or this diagram has not been tested in large clinical trials. We'll talk about some of them in, the, in, in a few slides, but uh, that's at least you should keep in mind. So this is where all this uh, issue of hibernation or assessment of hibernation come from. It comes from this comes from multiple single center studies with various uh, uh, size uh, sample size. Uh, it comes from this uh, Altman paper looking at re revascularizing viable versus non-viable myocardium and the impact of revascularization, what it shows if you revascularize viable myocardium, uh, you have lower event rate. And if revascularize dead myocardium, you don't have that, you don't get the benefit, but you expose the patient to the risk of revascularization. And finally, on the right-hand side, this is the PAR trial looking at, uh, this is the only probably randomized trial looking at uh, an FDG PET uh, a driven protocol for reassessment of uh, revascularization and uh, outcomes. And you can see here, if you use this uh, uh, method of assessing whether the, the treating physician adhered to the recommendation of the PET, uh, it reached statistical significance, although the entire trial was not statistically significant for benefit. After we decide that we need to assess revascularization, we have to separate the patients into two, two groups, the non-diabetics and the diabetics as far as the patient preparation. And that for, for the following few slides, I'll be using the guidelines, the beautiful guidelines actually uh, recommended by the American Society of Nuclear Cardiology on how to perform a cardiac PET uh, for these uh, patients. So we have to uh, think about diabetics and non-diabetics separately for multiple reasons. Uh, importantly, we need to uh, achieve glucose control in all these patients in order to get adequate imaging. So we, we target glucose loading of these patients. This will allow the glucose to increase at least for a short period of time to allow us to use some at least endogenous insulin and exogenous insulin to drive the FDG intracellularly and see the myocardium. This is the standard protocol that we, have, we use for our non-diabetic patients and some labs do use variation on that, but in general, it's the same thing. The patient has to be fasting for six to 12 hours. In general, we use that for almost all our stress tests. Uh, they show up to the lab. On arrival to the lab, they get a blood uh, glucose checked. Uh, we uh, orally load them with glucose. And then we start checking the blood sugar to see uh, where we are before we uh, start infusing uh, uh, insulin and, uh, and therefore, and then after that, uh, FDG. So once we get to the point here with uh, administering FDG, uh, we uh, check the glucose again. If it's still elevated, we re-inject uh, 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 insulin, and we have a, an algorithm for that that's available in this document I showed you earlier. And then we begin the test imaging or the PET imaging uh, at uh, zero to 90 minutes. It depends how, off, how soon we achieve the uh, glucose uh, clamp. In diabetic uh, patients, we don't rely on the, on the endogenous uh, insulin production. Therefore, most of the loading uh, will have to be followed by some injection of insulin uh, to achieve uh, a glucose clamp and uh, good uh, image uh, quality. Here's the uh, table for how much insulin we give depending on the blood sugar. Uh, so we have a range, of course, the lower the, ins the lower the blood sugar, the lower the insulin dose we give. Uh, and uh, once we have a, if we have a blood sugar above 200, usually uh, 
the nurses in our lab will come and talk to us and we give the patient six units or a higher depending on how, is the, how high is the blood sugar. Again, uh, we repeat this. So we have the patient fasting, they come in, uh, we glucose load them, inject the FTG, clamp uh, the, uh, the glucose uh, down to usually below 100 to get good images. And then we start the, uh, uh, the uh, PET uh, imaging. Before uh, we finish uh, the, the, uh, the protocol and send the patient home, every single time make sure a physician uh, looks at the images and make sure that these images are adequate. It is not uncommon that we have to actually uh, re-inject uh, probably insulin, uh, wait a little bit and re-image the patient to get better uh, image uh, quality. This is the dose of, uh, of uh, FTG we use. It depends on whether you're using a 3D uh, mode acquisition or 2D. In a 3D mode acquisition, of course, we use a lower dose, uh, lower millicuries of FTG. Uh, we uh, delay uh, the images usually between 45 and 60 minutes, uh, and then we go on for the uh, images. We uh, of, often image anywhere between 10 and 30 minutes. It seems for us about the 10 to 15 minutes is a sweet spot. Otherwise the patients start moving and we get into trouble and all the images are attenuation corrected in the modern systems with CT uh, with uh, reconstruction at two to five millimeters. Again, make sure you look at the images before you send the patient uh, home. Then we go to the display of the images. Uh, we have two parts of the display. We look at the perfusion images and the F18 FTG images. There is no point in looking at the F18 FTG images unless you have the perfusion images to compare with. And I will show you some examples of that. So there are three, three easy steps uh, on how to do this. So this is first the perfusion images. We look at the rest and stress perfusion images as we have uh, shown you in multiple uh, videos on this uh, channel. Uh, this is a patient with a fixed lateral wall defect as you can see it in, here in the horizontal long axis. You can see it here in the short axis, inferior infralateral fixed defect. Uh, not much ischemia on this uh, study. Then we go to the rest and FTG images right here. And the FTG images you can see here in this area of uh, fixed defect in the lateral wall of the perfusion images, you have a matched defect in the FTG images. This is the hallmark of scarred myocardium. So this is a scarred myocardium. This is how we display it, stress images, rest images, and FTG images uh, on, the, uh, on the right hand side here, almost a matching defect all across. So no viability in this instance, no ischemia, no viability, a fixed scarred lateral wall. So the next uh, step is to look at other patterns that we, we look at. So this is a, a patient uh, who comes here with a, a match defect. Again, this is rest and stress. These are the FTG images. This is, well, we read it on an old system that used to label them as delayed, but these are FTG images here. There's a very probably tiny amount of viability right here at the basal lateral, basal inferior wall on the FTG images, but in general, this is a fixed uh, match defect. This is a patient, as I told you before, who had a, uh, it's important to look at the perfusion images, rest and stress images, perfusion images. You can see here a, a reversibility in the inferior infralateral wall from the rest of stress images, no defects on the rest images, there is no need for FTG in, these, uh, in, these, uh, 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 in this instance. So we, therefore we stop, we don't do the FTG and we send the patient home, we call the scheme. What about mismatch defect? This is a patient who comes in with chest pain, uh, constant chest pain, goes to the ER uh, multiple times, multiple centers, they do a spec on her. Uh, the spec shows an inferior inferolateral fixed defect as you can see right here, including even the inferior septum. They told her, you know, you have no ischemia, we can't target anything. She comes to our center, we do an FTG image, as you can see here, again, fixed defect, not much to, uh, to talk about. Then you can go next to the uh, FTG images and you can see here right away, uh, you have this fixed defect on the perfusion images in the inferior infralateral wall. And that defect fills up with FTG beautifully uh, right here. So you can see here right away, this patient has uh, hibernation of the entire segment that we thought it was dead and scarred uh, on the perfusion images. So this is what we call a mismatch defect. You have a defect on the rest images with, uh, that fills up with FTG uh, uh, in the uh, uh, metabolic images. 
uh, on this channel again we'll make many many videos showing you different patterns uh, to fit mismatch defects and match defects in different uh, uh, coronary territories. This is an example of a patient who comes in with this fixed defect in the LAD territory here. I can see it in the perfusion images on top. Large, severe fixed defect in the LAD territory involving the anterior wall, septum, uh, apex. And you can see here on the uh, FDG images on the bottom, uh, this patient has a uh, complete uh, uh, basically uh, viability in that in those uh, segments, uh, including all the septum, the apex, the anterior wall. This is a viable myocardium. This patient uh, went on uh, to revascularization. This is a patient with CTO of the circumflex coronary artery, comes in with a defect in the lateral wall, as you can see right here. Before we proceed uh, to opening that CTO with the FDG images, as you can see in the bottom images here, and you can see that lateral wall picks up FDG beautifully in the short axis, horizontal long axis, vertical long axis, indicating hibernation in, in those segments. Then you have the issue of glucose uptake in normal tissue. Normal tissue utilizes glucose. So this is a patient with completely normal heart, normal rest and stress images. Uh, they did not check these images before the, uh, the patient went on to the FDG, but you can see in this patient, you have physiologic heterogeneity in FDG uptake. This is a, a reason why you should always look, compare the FDG images with perfusion images. Because from this hibernation study, we're not talking about uh, uh, you know, inflammation here, we're talking about detection of hibernation and the way the study is protocol for hibernation. Uh, this is uh, physiologic FDG uptake and it doesn't mean much really. You have normal perfusion at rest and post stress, no ischemia, no scar, and the FDG is just physiologically heterogeneous in different segments of the myocardium. Now, to finally, we get to the uh, point where we have to report uh, the findings we have. Again, we, study with the, we start with the same uh, uh, pattern we've done in all these images where we start with demographics. Uh, the coronary anatomy, if known, preferably you should know the coronary anatomy before, before you embark on assessing hibernation. Uh, so you know if you have uh, coronaries that are suitable for revascularization, then we, 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 uh, we write here what we've done. This is all for QA, what dose of FDG we used, what was the blood sugar during the time, did we achieve glucose uh, clamping, was the patient diabetic or not diabetic. And then we describe the same way we describe perfusion defects. We describe the size, the severity, and the location of the stress and rest perfusion defects. We do the same thing for reversibility. And we can then talk about match defects on the FDG, whether they match. We have a defect on rest, defect on stress, and now defect on FDG indicating scar, or whether we have a defect on the rest images that fills up with FDG indicating hibernation. Then we go on to report ejection fraction because we have the perfusion images indicated the images, and then we give a meaningful conclusion describing the defect, how big it is, what's the area of hibernation and related to a coronary territory. So when they decide on going to target revascularization, they know which vessel to go, uh, to go at. So the purpose of this presentation was to know when to seek evaluation for hibernation, uh, know when not to assess for hibernation, for myocardial hibernation, know the purpose of hibernation assessment. Is the purpose is to improve ejection fraction? Is it to improve survival? Or is it to improve both? Know how to prepare the patient for the test image acquisition and display, and how to display these images in the standard way we learn for perfusion images, and how to report your findings in a meaningful way. Thank you for listening uh, to this uh, video cast, and we'll see you very soon.